The Window to the Outside World, a short story from the anthology series Nightmares, Dreams, and the Monsters in Between, written by Sam Qualiana. To me, looking out the window to the outside world was like looking into a fish tank, just glass between myself and another existence. I could see it. It was close enough to touch, but it was foreign to me, unreachable like another planet. I lived in a small town populated with many people where nobody knew each other's names. Trauma from my childhood made me agoraphobic. My parents vanished some years back without a trace, leaving my sister Pallas and I to fend for ourselves. I believed something horrible happened to them the night they disappeared, but my sister thought otherwise. She supposed they abandoned us and went to live the life they dreamed of before we took that away from them. New neighbors. The tall man from across the street took out the trash descending the long staircase from his Victorian home on top of the hill. He and his family moved in late at night, just one week prior. I'd hear them at times, but for the most part I only saw the tall man and the doctor. At least I assumed the other man was a doctor, considering he always wore a lab coat. Palace, our new neighbors seem very strange, don't you think? I asked. You always let your imagination get the best of you, River. The only strange thing around here is you. Pallas responded. I ignored her insults, keeping watch on my unusual neighbor. The tall man stopped at his doorstep, suspiciously looking around before entering. He's up to something. I know it. The following morning I woke from my bed, a thick foam pad covered with blankets and pillows on the floor. I stumbled into the living room, stretching and yawning as I made my way to the window. I looked at the neighbor's house, tall and wondrous. It seemed to be a hundred times larger than my own. He must be a doctor, I mumbled. What are you doing? Pallas asked. Nothing, just enjoying the beautiful weather, I responded. River, go outside if you want to enjoy the weather. Outside, I shrieked, jolting backward. Why? That's insane. You know I can't go outside. Nothing will hurt you out there, and you know that, River. Are you kidding me? I shouted, taking a deep breath before composing myself. I'm sorry, it's just that since mother and father- Going outside didn't kill mother and father. They left us, River. Pallas interrupted. That's not true. They would never leave us, I whimpered. I wiped the tears from my eyes and looked out the window, trying not to let Pallas see me cry. Whatever. If it helps you sleep at night, believe what you want. Pallas replied. Well, some of us need to pay the bills around here. Don't get yourself into any trouble while I'm gone. I scoffed, still focused on the neighbor's house. Pallas left and I continued my investigation, perched in a chair. Looking through the window, I suspected I was bound to see something to justify my curiosity. I just needed to be patient. A noise woke me from my sleep. I must have dozed off in the chair. Was it already nighttime? A light shined bright on the neighbor's porch, illuminating the doctor across the street. I leaned closer to the window, feeling the light touch my face. I looked carefully at the doctor and realized he was pulling something up the stairs. I couldn't quite make it out, but it seemed like he was dragging a body bag, and there was something inside. The doctor stopped, looking right at me. My skin crawled, and I ducked under the window frame, breathing rapidly. I waited a moment, then returned to the shadows to watch the stranger. The doctor looked around suspiciously, then continued to pull the object into his house. The tall man greeted him at the door, helping guide it inside. River! A voice shouted, rousing me from my sleep. I jumped out of my skin, visibly shaken by the awakening. I must have fallen asleep again, this time under the window. Then when I came to my senses, I saw my sister standing over me. Pallas, oh thank God it's only you. The neighbor, I saw him dragging a body, I cried. Pallas rolled her eyes. Oh please, she said, setting a bag of groceries on the kitchen table. I swear if you go outside, I said, pausing as I swallowed my words. I saw them turn on the basement light after they dragged it inside. Maybe if you get close enough to the window, you could see something in there. Okay, sure. Let's go, you lead the way. Pallas suggested. 
Why don't you just go and tell me if you find anything? I countered. Oh my god, you're such a chicken shit. Pallas groaned. She aggressively stormed away, pushing open the front door and walking confidently to the neighbor's house. I remained inside our home watching from the window. Pallas stopped at their basement window, peering inside. She looked back at me, frustrated, shrugging her shoulders. Suddenly the outside lights turned on at the house, but instead of running she wandered towards the front. No, 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 what are you doing? I whispered. The tall man walked down the stairs towards my sister, and the two of them carried on a short conversation. I saw her point to our house, he looked directly at me. I fumbled backward, tripping into my armchair. While Pallas looked at me, the tall man hit her in the side of the head, knocking her unconscious. He picked up my sister and carried her up the stairs towards his house. Halfway there, he paused to look back at me, then continued until he was inside. I screamed aloud and covered my mouth, continuing to watch. This is all my fault. The doctor came outside, looking around frantically, making sure nobody witnessed anything. He quickly fled back into the house, and I could hear him yelling at the tall man from inside. I leaned my back against the wall and dropped to the floor, hyperventilating. The room started to spin, and I closed my eyes. What do I do? What do I do? I cried. Palace was going to die, and I was going to be completely alone in the world. I had to call the cops, but I didn't have a phone. Maybe I could use hers. I searched her purse, but she must have taken it with her. I paced back and forth, staring out the window. I had to do something. My agoraphobia couldn't hold me back any longer. This was bigger than me, greater than my fears. I needed to be a man. I needed to save my sister. I was her only hope. I stood tall and walked to the door, reaching for the knob, and I stopped. My emotions were retaking control. I retreated back against the wall. No, 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 I can't do that. I can't go out there, I argued to myself. I paced again, wasting precious minutes. I glared at the door once more. I had to do it. I reached for the knob, grabbed a hold, twisted it, and opened the door. The night's breeze hit me like a freight train, and I stumbled, taking two steps back. Oh dear, I gasped, feeling faint. I reached my foot out as if I was putting it in ice-cold water, afraid to take the first step. Finally, I stepped down on the concrete sidewalk, then my other foot. I was outside for the first time in years. I looked around at my feet, at my hands. I gasped for air and tears rolled down my cheeks. I stood tall. Nothing can hurt me. I was proud of myself, confident. I marched towards the neighbor's house, ready to kick down their door and save my sister, when suddenly I stopped. I surprised myself when I casually knocked on the door. What am I doing? Why didn't I ask the other neighbors to call the police? What an idiot. I'm a 15-year-old boy, ready to take on a family of killers. What am I doing? I prepared to retreat, but before I could take a step, the door opened up. The tall man stood in the doorway, looking at me. What do you want? He asked. Did he not actually see me before? Did I make that up in my mind? Unsure of what to say, I blurted the first thing that came to my head. Hi, I said with a shaky voice, leaving nothing else to follow up on my brief introduction. Go home, kid. Whatever you're selling, I don't want it. The tall man said, Okay, bye, I replied. I quickly turned around and walked steadily down the staircase. I didn't get far when I stopped myself and turned back around. What am I doing? I walked to the door again and knocked a second time. Wait, what am I doing? I could have gone somewhere else to get the police. Am I really this stupid? This time the doctor opened the door. I was confused, unsure of what to do. The man grabbed me, pulling me inside. Come on, come on. Don't be shy. Come inside. He said, gripping my arm firmly. The doctor brought me into the living room. The place smelled like mildew, cigarettes, and piss. Before me was the doctor's odd-looking family. Each one sat on worn-out furniture, watching an old tube television. The doctor gripped me by the back of the neck and displayed me to his household. Hey, everyone, this nice young man has come to join us this evening. Let me introduce you to the family. This lovely woman is my mother, Ruby. I examined the obese woman, her skin a pale white, blue veins spiderwebbed all over her neck, face, and arms. Her eyes were so light they looked silver. The woman took a long drag on her cigarette, coughing and hacking as she blew out the smoke. Hello, dear. She cooed. This is my father, Rudolph. The doctor said, Rudolph stared at the television like he had no idea what was happening. He either didn't care to meet me, or he couldn't see or hear. His skin was rugged like sandpaper, and his flesh drooped down like a bulldog. My brother, Ripley. The tall man. I recognized him. Runt. Ripley said as he stared me up and down. Silly me, I never even introduced myself. I'm Dr. Rigby, and... Wait, where's Roderick? The doctor asked. 
He looked around for a moment and then acted as if he remembered after all. Oh, yes. My cousin Roderick is in the basement. You can meet him some other time, perhaps. The doctor said. No, I want to meet him now, I said authoritatively. Rigby glared at me. Oh, to be young again and full of angst. Fine, then. Let's go. He said, nearly dragging me into the basement. When we got to the bottom of the stairs, an unusual, balding man swayed back and forth. He wore overalls and a tank top that was stained yellow. As I observed the basement surroundings, I noticed a large bowl of water and a plate on the ground. It seemed like it was for a dog, but there were no animals in sight anywhere in the house. I could only conclude that the dishes belonged to Roderick. The beastly man looked up at us and screamed, revealing a mostly toothless mouth and deformed face. Roderick ran away when we reached the bottom of the stairway. He sat down on the ground and laughed childishly. Roderick, this is our neighbor. What is your name, son? I swallowed hard. He did know I was his neighbor. Riv River, uh, my name's River, I stuttered. Roderick, this is River, he said. The doctor leaned in close to me. You seem to fit right in, River. Where's my sister? Where's Palace? I asked, tired of playing his games. Dr. Rigby took a few steps back, looking nervous. What sister? What are you talking about? He asked, unapologetically toying with me. Hey, Roderick, do that thing. You know, show River your trick. The doctor chuckled. Roderick laughed, clapping his hands, getting ready to perform like he was some kind of animal. But before he could, I interrupted him. I don't want to see a stupid trick. I want my sister back, I yelled at the doctor. Roderick seemed scared, sneaking out of my sight. I wasn't worried about him, though. I walked closer to Dr. Rigby, growing a perplexing sense of confidence. I don't know what you're talking about. We never have visitors. Maybe she went somewhere else. Rigby suggested. I saw her get taken by. Suddenly, something hit me over the back of the head. All I saw was darkness. My eyes fluttered. I couldn't tell if I was in a dream. Roderick hobbled over me, holding a log. Dr. Rigby petted him on the head. Good job, cousin. Good job. And the darkness came over me again. I woke up as abruptly as I was knocked out. My head throbbed in a way I'd never felt before. I groaned in pain, unable to hold my tears inside. I told her it was dangerous. I knew we should never leave that damned house. Look at me now. No, I can't die here. We can't die here. I was tied down on a couch when I woke. There was duct tape wrapped around my wrists and ankles. Rigby's whole family sat around me, just staring. I struggled, trying to stand up, but I couldn't. Hold still, son. This shouldn't hurt. It will calm you down. The doctor said before injecting me with a syringe. I flailed in a panicked craze, having no idea what he was putting inside my body. Then, in a matter of seconds, I faded to a lifeless stupor. Dr. Rigby leaned back in his chair. He tilted his head, watching me curiously. I felt like I heard strange sounds in my head. Were they voices? I twitched, feeling myself fading. A memory came back to me, and I was with my mother and father again. They laughed and talked to each other, but I couldn't remember their voices. Then I saw Pallas. She was wearing black. It was raining. We were at a funeral. But whose funeral was it? I saw the tombstone, my name engraved on it. River Rose, February 13th, 2005, October 21st, 2020. I was only a ghost floating over my grave. Pallas looked me in the eyes and said, Wake up, River. You need to save me. Then in a sudden surge of power, adrenaline shot through my veins. I sat upward and kicked Dr. Rigby with both feet, and he flew backward on his chair. In doing so, my legs became free from their restraints. As Rigby hit the ground, his seat splintered into pieces. I dragged the tape that was restraining my wrists across the broken frame, freeing my hands. The tall man checked on Rigby, making sure he was okay. Then his attention focused on me. I yanked a sharp piece of the chair from its frame, holding it as a weapon to defend myself. The tall man stepped down, not ready to die. He looked up to the staircase briefly. I knew what that meant. Pallas was up there. My ears were ringing. I staggered across the room, trying to fight the poison they put in my body. I ran up the stairs, falling into the walls on my way up. Palace, I called out. I could hear her, mumbling, not far away. I went from room to room, searching for her. Then a thumping noise from above drew my attention to a staircase leading to an attic. I made my way up to the dark chamber. The full moon poured its light through an octagon window, illuminating my sister. 
I hurried to her rescue, untying her restraints and removing the gag from her mouth. She hugged me tightly and my head began to spin. I tumbled over, covering my eyes with my hand, trying to make everything stop moving. What did they do to you? She sobbed. I looked around the room as my eyes adjusted to the moonlight. The attic was full of strange and unusual things. Human skulls, organs pickled in jars, furniture made of bone. We need to leave here now, I shouted. We ran down the stairs to the first floor when Dr. Rigby and Ripley, the tall man, ambushed us. Rigby grabbed my sister in a chokehold while Ripley shoved me full force through the wall. I lost my weapon in the assault. Roderick laughed, applauding his family as he spectated. Ripley pulled me to my feet by the collar. He handed me off to the doctor, exchanging me for my sister, and they dragged us both in separate directions. Pallas hung over Ripley's shoulder, reaching for me as he carried her away, screaming my name. Don't give up, I'll get you back. I swear I will, I assured my sister, still unsure how I'd get myself out of this mess. Rigby pulled me into his lab. I saw a shelf with jars of pickled animals, deformed creatures, some even human-like. Roderick entered the room, forcing me onto a table that sat in the center. The doctor and Roderick tied me down, overpowering me with their strength. Rigby injected me with another needle. No, no, no! I shouted as he removed the syringe from my thigh. Seems you're going to need a more potent dose this time. He chuckled. I tried to fight it again, but it overtook me quickly. My body lay motionless and numb. I couldn't move an inch. I was paralyzed. Rigby pulled a scalpel from a drawer. Roderick clapped in excitement. Rigby leaned over me. I could see him. I could feel his breath on my face, but I couldn't move my body. The doctor carefully removed my left eyeball. Roderick jumped up and down like a monkey in a cage. Rigby put the eye in a jar full of liquid and set it down where I could see it. The doctor sewed up the wound and bandaged my head. We don't want it to get infected now, do we? He chuckled. Roderick jumped up and down, laughing like a maniac. Rigby placed the knife on my chest when he was suddenly interrupted. Rigby! Rigby, are you in your lab? His mother yelled from across the hallway. Yes, mother. I'm busy. I'm trying to entertain our guest. He replied. Rigby, please put away the dishes, sweetheart. Mother! Can't you make Ripley do it? I'm preoccupied. Ripley did it last night, darling. Dr. Rigby let out an exasperated huff. All right, I'm coming. He looked back to me. Don't go anywhere. Rigby hooted a sinister giggle and ran out of the lab. Roderick followed closely behind him. I struggled to move, but I couldn't. I focused on my hand, but my fingers wouldn't budge. I looked around the room the best I could, then back at my hand. Nothing. Rudolph very slowly crept into the lab. He looked like he was barely cognizant of his surroundings. He moved so slowly, it felt like hours passed as I watched him come close to me. I focused again, this time. My index finger twitched. Rudolph grabbed a knife from the table, inspecting it. I struggled to move, but even if I regained my strength, I was tied down too tight. I thought to myself, this is the end. Rudolph lifted the knife, slowly inching it towards my wrist, then he cut my restraints. I breathed a sigh of relief and tears rolled down my cheek, but I still couldn't move. The old man grabbed something from a cabinet. He turned to face me with a syringe in his hand. I thought for a moment I was safe and then I was quickly filled with dread once more. Tears kept pouring from my unbandaged eye. As I lay motionless on the table, Rudolph leaned close to me, injecting the needle into my heart. Relax, this will make it go away, he whispered. I tried to tell him no, I didn't want to die. Don't hurt my ruby, he whispered. I stared at the man confused, when suddenly, a pulse of energy shot through my body. I felt electrified, like I could run a marathon, I was ready for anything. I know, mother, and I'll take care of it as soon as I finish operating. Just wait a few more minutes. Rigby said walking into the room. I was still lying on the operating table. Rigby looked at his father. What are you doing here? He asked, confused. I leapt from the table and slit Rigby's throat with the knife his father used to cut my restraints. The blood sprayed all over the room. Rigby tried to hold his throat shut, stumbling across the room. He crashed into the shelf full of jars, smashing them to pieces. He lay on the ground, motionless. I knew he was dead. I ran out of the lab and came face to face with Ruby. She jumped back, eyeballing my knife. I hesitated, don't hurt Ruby, then ran past her. I ran up the stairs and crept by each bedroom looking for my sister. I came to a room where I heard loud noises from inside. I slowly snuck in and found Pallas tied to a chair. Ripley was next to her watching TV at a deafening volume. I approached Ripley from behind until I was just a few feet away. The program he was watching went to a commercial break, and with that, the volume dropped for only seconds. But in those seconds, my foot squeaked a floorboard, drawing Ripley's attention to me. 
He looked back at me, still sitting in his chair. He focused on the bloody knife in my hand, and then he smiled at me. I stared at him, confused. When out of nowhere, Roderick grabbed me from behind, lifting me off the ground. The knife fell to the floor and Ripley turned back to face the television. Roderick bit me in the shoulder, breaking the skin. I flung my head back as hard as I could and smashed Roderick in the nose. He let me go, and I sprawled across the floor, grabbing the knife. Roderick charged me at full speed and I stuck him in the gut with the blade. Roderick staggered back, holding his bleeding stomach. I moved in and stabbed him again repeatedly until he collapsed on the floor. When Ripley heard the thud, he looked back at me and stood up. He pulled out a razor and walked over to Palace. Worried he would harm her, I rushed him. Ripley turned towards me and sliced me across the chest. I staggered briefly and sliced Ripley back on the right forearm. Ripley twitched, shook off the pain, and came after me. I ducked his assault and stabbed him in the stomach, twisting the blade and pulling it downward. Ripley dropped to the ground lifeless. I ran over to Palace and freed her from her restraints. River, what did they do to you? She sobbed as she touched my face, exploring my bandages. Come on, let's get out of here, I insisted. We ran out of the neighbor's house, crossed the street and stumbled back into our home. I locked the door and all the windows before sitting down on my favorite chair. Is it over? Palace asked, fumbling through a kitchen cabinet to find a first aid kit. Yeah, it's over, I replied, staring out the window to the outside world. Palace stood in front of me, blocking my view as she cleaned my wounds. She held her phone to her ear and called the police as she patched me up. She stepped away to grab towels and the window was visible to me again. To my surprise, I saw Ruby staring at us through the window, a chainsaw in her hands. The puttering sound of the saw made Palace scream in terror. She ran to the corner of the kitchen, grabbing a knife from the cutting board to defend herself. Ruby carved a hole into our front door with her saw, pulling the blade out just to stick it in another place. I frantically searched for something to defend myself with, but I couldn't find a weapon that would stand a chance in hell against hers. I grabbed a kitchen knife and thought of alternatives to stopping Ruby. I looked at the ground, a shag rug, here goes nothing, I thought. Ruby stuck the chainsaw through the door for another cut. I wrapped the rug around the blade, and the chainsaw got tangled into the carpet and abruptly stopped. At that moment, I swung open the door. The momentum caused Ruby to stumble towards me, and I planted my knife in her neck. Mm. She groaned, staring into my eye. I pushed her back, and she collapsed onto the sidewalk. Stay the fuck out of my house, I said, slamming the door shut and locking it. Palace ran over to me, and we embraced each other. Ouch, I groaned. River, I'm so proud of you. I can't believe you left the house. The lights from police cruisers flashed into the window, and I finally felt like this crazy night had come to an end. You answer at this time, I said to Palace. If you enjoyed this audiobook, please like and subscribe for more content from the Matrosha channel.